Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, Salina Board of Zoning Appeals. It's four o'clock and we'll call the meeting to order. As far as the roll call, I see that everyone is present except for Mr. Bruce Bennett. And so we do have a quorum in order to hear business today. And I can confirm that the packet for today's meeting has been posted and we have provided required notice of today's meeting. So we are uh, ready to proceed to item two with okay, your discretion. Thank you very much. So our next order of business is approval of the minutes from the uh, January 16th meeting. Everybody had a chance to look at those briefly? Mm -hmm. We'll entertain a motion to uh, approve those, me those minute meetings, meeting minutes as written. I move that we approve the January 16th, 2020 meeting minutes. Second. Okay. Second was David Holgram. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to new business now, uh, which is the uh, application of uh, Victor 20-1, and I'll turn it over to the staff for their presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This application has been filed by Mr. Jason Reed of Adams Jones Law Firm, and that application was filed on behalf of the owner of this property, who is Mr. Marvin Johnson. And the request that is before you um, involves three separate variance requests. And the first request is a minimum lot size variance for property in an R2 district. And the request is a variance of 11,750 square feet from 18,000 square feet. That is the minimum lot size that the district would require in order to have six dwelling units, and this lot has 6,250 square feet. A, a minimum lot width variance of 10 feet from 60 feet. That's the minimum lot width in an R2 district. And this lot has a width of 50 feet. And a, a parking variance of 10 spaces from 12 off-street spaces. That's the minimum number required by city code for to support six dwelling units, and that um, would be a reduction of 10 spaces from 12 to two. And the rationale for the application is to allow an existing duplex at 741, 743 South 2nd Street to be converted into a six unit apartment building. So by, um, just by way of history, this is a lot that is located south of Crawford Street on the east side of South 2nd uh, with Bond Street being to the south. The lot is platted at 50 feet width and 125 feet of depth. In 1961, Hayworth Lumber Company obtained a building permit to build a two-family dwelling or duplex. The property was zoned uh, B duplex at that time. And then after the building was constructed, it was purchased by Herbert and Esser Wessel in 1962. And they owned the property until 1992 when it was purchased by Mr. Marvin Johnson. When the city was comprehensively rezoned and remapped, the B district became the R2 district. And our R2 district, as the two uh, denotes, is our duplex zoning district. Um, at some point in the past, four living units were apparently created in the basement of this building without obtaining building permits, addresses, or separate utility meters. The building services staff received a complaint and the owner was required to vacate the four basement living units. And there had been demising walls uh, and work done in the basement and so in lieu of removing those basement improvements that had been made, the owner, Mr. Johnson, entered into a compliance agreement with the building official, uh, Mr. Pilcher, who's here today. And that agreement allowed the basement improvements to remain in place pending resolution of a zoning application that would authorize the four additional dwelling units on this lot. So 
this application is part of the zoning application to uh, that would need to be approved in order for that to occur. So as we noted, this is a R2 zone property. Duplexes are a permitted use in the R2 district. Multi-unit apartments are not. Um, in order to have multi-family dwellings in an R2 zone property, you must apply for and receive approval from the City Planning Commission of a conditional use permit. And uh, Mr. Olson is your uh, representative from the Planning Commission. In order for the Planning Commission to approve multi-family apartments, they must find that the proposed use conforms with all applicable zoning ordinance requirements. So what we've outlined for you today is three areas where this property does not conform with the R2 zoning. It does not conform because there's not enough lot area under the R2 district to support a sixplex. It does not conform because the lot, the minimum lot width for multifamily dwellings is 60 feet and this lot has 50 feet and then it does not conform from the standpoint of off street parking uh, because if you were to build a new six unit apartment building you'd have to provide 12 off street spaces for your tenants. So just going down the list um, we have a 6,250 6, square foot lot and that provides a little over 3,000 square feet per dwelling unit for the two units and that that conforms with the R2 requirement. If we added four dwelling units that would result in a density of having only a thousand square feet per family which does not meet the minimum lot area requirement. The minimum lot width as I noted is 60 feet and the requirement would be if this were if we were issuing a permit for a new sixplex would be 12 off street spaces. So the question before you is the owner wishes to convert the buildings or the building at 741, 742 into a sixplex through the building permit process and planning staff has identified that there was a need to apply to this board for variances to vary from the strict application of lot area, lot width, and off-street parking. So this application has been filed by the property owner's attorney, essentially for post-construction variances that would be needed to allow us to issue building and occupancy permits that would allow this to be converted from a duplex to a six-unit apartment house. And so um, Dustin has shown some aerial photos. I don't know if you could go to the zoning map, Dustin, just so that we could we could see. You can see that the uh, most of the surrounding zoning except for one spot, I think that's R3, is zoned R2 with a, the light yellow being R1 single family zoning. And so the uh, Again, the R1 is single family, R2 is duplex zoning, and then R3 zone property would be um, where you would most often find multifamily apartments. And so the first thing is you know that the uh, first factor to look at is are there unique conditions about this property? And the need for variance must be caused by a condition which is unique to the property and is not created by the actions of the property owner or applicant. So the applicant's representative states at the time of the purchase that Mr. Johnson had reason to believe the apartments in the basement were allowed as representations and visual inspection demonstrated that apartments had been constructed. Uh, the previous owner represented to Mr. Johnson that apartments were allowed as the construction had been significantly undertaken. Our records indicate that the basement at this address was designed and intended to provide a laundry room and storage space for the upstairs duplex tenants. We're not able to establish when the construction work dividing the downstairs space occurred the Wessels owned the property from 1962 to 1992. 
We did issue egress window permits for basement windows in 1993 and looking back with that, should have asked more questions about what the egress windows were for. Um, the other thing we would note is that next door to the property to the north at 737, 739, that property is also owned by Mr. Johnson. The Wessels never owned that property, but the same thing happened at that property where there were basement units created uh, without permits being issued or certificates of occupancy, and that, that case is still in the enforcement phase and has not yet been resolved. Um, so we have two scenarios. The requested variance was created by the actions of the current owner or that Mr. Johnson was an innocent purchase without knowledge. Uh, no matter which of those is the case, it should not be difficult for an owner to find out whether building permits had been issued for the living units and whether those were established legally, especially given the R2 duplex zoning the lack of assigned addresses for other units and the fact that there are only two meters on the property. So just to, um, just to amplify on that, we've, we've had some cases um, where we have been contacted by Kansas Gas or by Westar, now Evergy, about a request to add a separate meter at a property and Westar will not add a separate meter to a property without an assigned address. And so one of the telltale indicators at this property is that there's only two meters and there's only two addresses. And if the, if the city was issuing permits for a single family dwelling to be converted to a duplex, we would assign a separate physical address for the second unit and require it to have a separate meter. Um, and if, if there had been permits applied for and issued in this case, instead of two addresses, we'd have six addresses and we would have mul multiple meters, not, not two meters. So from our perspective, there's not anything unique about this particular lot that's not shared by all the other lots on the east side of South 2nd Street. Most of the lots are the same size. They're all zoned R2. They were all built as duplexes. And so except for the fact that the basement of this building was subdivided, we're not able to find any unique physical conditions on this particular property. Um, the property to the east is a duplex, um, so multifamily should not be an issue. We're, that's what the applicant's representative indicates. And of course, we have a large drainage ditch um, to the west, so there are no neighbors over there to affect. Um, so all, all we would note is that the, the difference between the two and R2 and the three and R3 is to indicate the difference between duplex zoning and apartment zoning. And so um, viewing as a neighbor, viewing this from outside, um, there would not be any real noticeable uh, changes to the property. The only thing that might be noticeable is if you had four more living units here and had a total of six and only had two parking spaces, um, it's probably going to lead to more on-street parking, could lead to illegal front yard parking with parking in the grass or dirt. And so we think the primary effect on neighbors would be noticed by the lack of off-street parking, not so much the physical changes to the building. Um, the applicant's representative indicates that Mr. Johnson purchased the property with the basement apartments already under construction. He has not affected the property by making changes to the basement. Um, applicant believes it would be a financial hardship to remove the physical improvements that have already been made. Um, our response as a staff would be that if a building permit had been applied for, 
to build or create those spaces, we would have had an opportunity to deny the permit and explain why to the applicant. So we believed that any hardship experienced by the applicant would be to a degree self self created um, by not applying for permits or certificate of occupancy. Um, we also don't believe that the inability to collect rent from six units instead of two is an unnecessary hardship, but that, that is for the board to determine. Um, the apartments constructed serve a vital purpose for the city and provide a need that's not otherwise being met. The request for lot width is only a reduction by amount of 10 feet. The square footage of lot area for the number of apartments is not necessary. Based on the tendency, there's not a need for 12 off-street spaces. There are not other occupants across the street from this property. And so um, when we look at things like noise, crowding, safe conditions, those are more of a function of the density on a lot or within a structure than they are the size or location of the structure. So we're not proposing to enlarge the size of the structure or change the appearance of the existing structure, but essentially to triple the number of living units within the same 1,690 square foot building footprint. Um, so as we look at what the purpose is of our zoning regulations, one of the purposes to provide for adequate light, air, privacy, to secure safety from fire, flood, and other danger, and to prevent overcrowding and undue congestion. Um, so if, if this were a uh, empty lot today, a new six unit apartment building could not be built on this property without a zone, either a zoning change to R3 or approval of a conditional use permit by the Planning Commission or the approval of a plan development district by the Planning Commission. Even if that were approved, such new construction would require the builder to provide 12 off-street parking spaces. Um, if we looked at changing the zoning here to R3, that could be viewed as a spot zoning of an area that's predominantly R2. And so, the applicant is trying to change the use of this property from an R2 use to an R3 use um, through the variance process. So these variances are being requested to ratify or make conforming work that was performed without obtaining building permits. And staff believes that approval of the requested variances could result in overcrowding and undermine the intent of the zoning regulations and our density limits in the R2 district. So um, this is unique. It's not the kind of case we like to bring to you because it's a request for something that's after the fact, not before construction. Um, but it is a, a post-construction, after the fact variance. Um, it's significant to staff that no building permit was applied for or issued for the work and whether the owner should have known that a building permit was required, that's a judgment for you to make as board members. Um, from staff's perspective, it's important for the board to make clear findings in support of your decision if you decide to approve this request and to articulate any extenuating circumstances that you see in this case so that your decision would not create an favorable precedent for future decisions. Um, we've just provided a brief summary of our possible findings. We don't, as we look at this block of South 2nd Street, this lot itself is not unique compared to the surrounding lots. The need for the variants were created by previous actions taken by the owner of the property, regardless of who didn't obtain permits, no building permits were ever applied for or obtained. Um, the property can still legally be rented out as a duplex and the, uh, our concern is that approval of the variances would essentially create R3 density in an R2 district. 
So on page seven, we've outlined your alternatives. Your first alternative is you could approve the three requested variances that were outlined with or without any conditions. If the fine required findings of fact can be made, um, you could postpone action on this application if you find that you need additional information from staff or the applicant to reach a decision. Or you could deny the applicant's variance requests if you don't think the required findings to support a variance can be made. Um, staff is in a position where we're simply not able to recommend approval of post-construction variance requests that would ratify and make conforming work that was done without building permits. And so that is, that is staff's position. And we have uh, provided in your packet the original building permit from 1961, um, a floor plan of the basement modifications, a violation notice that was sent to the owner, and then there's a copy of the compliance agreement that was entered into with the building services department. And Mr. Pilcher, the building official, is here. Um, if you have any questions about the whys or wherefores of the compliance agreement, but the uh, the primary purpose of the re the compliance agreement was to not force the owner to rip all the improvements out of the basement until the zoning process had run its course. So with that, I'd be open to any questions that you have about our report or Mr. Pilcher's here if you have questions about the notice or compliance agreement. Okay, any questions for staff? No. Okay. Can we hear from the uh, requested uh, representative? Good afternoon, my name is Jason Reed. I'm with the Adams Jones Law Firm in Wichita. I'm here today on behalf of Mr. Marvin Johnson or actually Windsor Apartments who is the successor owner. Uh, Mr. Johnson has transferred all of his properties into an LLC, so it's Windsor Apartments. Uh, today, first, I'd like to start with just a bit of a background with some of the properties that Mr. Johnson has purchased and the, the picture that was previously up and there had been mentioned to property at 737 and 739 Second Street, which shares the lot. It's just to the north of the property in question here, which is 741 and 743. Mr. Johnson purchased that property in 1989, about two and a half years before he purchased the property that we're here today about. And I think that's important to kind of lay the groundwork for that because some of the, the statements that were first made regarding the uniqueness of this particular application. And we are here post, I mean, Mr. Johnson has used this sixplex since he purchased it in 1992 as a sixplex. And so we're here trying to, now that he has been made aware of the, the need and the, the lack of the permits, to go back and, and get the permitting in place so that, so that he could continue to still use this as a sixplex. And so some of the statements that were made in the packets that you have regarding the uniqueness, I wanted to refer um, to the statements that were made where the staff had concluded Basically, we believe that Mr. Johnson was a common denominator in two properties that didn't have permits by the statements that the property at 737 and 739 didn't have one, and the one at 741 and 743. It's not in your information, but it could be provided to each of you. A closing statement where Mr. Johnson, when he purchased the property in 1989, there were four properties listed on that closing statement and an allocation of the rent for each of those apartments. So I wanted to make sure to let you know that, that this is not a situation that Mr. Johnson caused the problem at 737 and 739 and somehow assumed then that he has also done this at 741 and 743. And the conditional use permit would allow this, this sixplex to continue and I also wanted to address the issue with the meters. First off, the meter issue, there, it's our belief there would not need to be separate meters if the rent included 
the utilities. I mean, why would there need have to be a reason for separate meters if rent included all of the utilities associated with it? Again, these apartments in the basement are unique. They are one bedroom, one bath, living room area. So that is the reason why there would not be meters for six different units. To address the issue of, well, Mr. Johnson could have um, looked for to see if permits had been obtained. When Mr. Johnson brought this property, it was already 30 years old. And he had just purchased a property two and a half years before, immediately across from his property, where it was already multifamily. So we believe he had a reason to rely that this property also could be used as multifamily because the one right across the way, now, as we find out, there are no permits for that. And so we're in the process of trying to address those issues. But that, at the time, Mr. Johnson wouldn't have any reason to to need to pull those to see if there was a permit when he's looking at that and he sees that there's already a sixplex that's being constructed in that. So we believe with the that addresses the uniqueness of this, that Mr. Johnson purchased this property with the items there, with the construction there. He didn't put this construction in. As far as the no adverse effects on the neighbors, um, staff points out that there would be a noticeable difference with the parking. This has been used as a sixplex for since 1992. There hasn't been any issues with the parking since Mr. Johnson has had the property. Based on the tenants that he has for this property, he rents the properties to, some are, um, they used to be through housing authority. There were some that are developmentally disabled that don't have a lot of income. And this provides a unique, um, area for them to live and be independent and won't have vehicles. They can't obtain driver's license and they wouldn't ever have vehicles. So since 1992 when he's purchased the property, we're not aware of any complaints because there's been an overcrowding of parking for these particular, this particular unit. As far as it being an unnecessary hardship, Mr. Johnson bought this property as a rental property and purchased it knowing that there, it was a sixplex. The facts show that he had reason to believe that a sixplex could be allowed in there. Part of that is the property that he purchased two and a half years prior, just to the north of that. As to the effect on public health, safety, and welfare, Again, this property has been there, has been Mr. Johnson since 1992. We're not aware of any noise complaints or any complaints because we have six units in that particular dwelling. So to, uh, to say that there could be or there may be, there hasn't been. To the conformity with the general spirit and intent of the zoning rules, this falls with, within that intent. There were statements made about um, spot zoning. I think on the zoning map that we saw, there was also an R3 property just one over and two down from where Mr. Johnson's property is. That's already zoned as R3. Conditional use permits to allow multifamily also can be allowed in this area. So it's it could be possibly considered spot zoning, but we have one R3 property in that block. So, I mean, to say it's spot zoning, we already have one that would be spot zoned, if you want to mention it that way. Um, the last piece that I would like to point out as part of preparing for this is that we also contacted the Sling County Appraiser and the Sling County Treasurer's Office to kind of check to see how this property was taxed. This isn't a situation in which Mr. Johnson has somehow been collecting rent and it's been taxed as a duplex. This property, I could only obtain records that go back 10 years because otherwise it was cost prohibitive. But from 2010 to present, this property is taxed as a sixplex. It has been taxed using the income approach to valuation. Everybody knows this was being used as a sixplex. We're not hiding anything. The letter that Mr. Johnson received in April 2019 stating 
where a tenant had complained, I believe it, it was with regard to a smoke detector, but then there were some other issues and it's set forth in the packet, the letter is, that this seems to be the first indication that Mr. Johnson had a sixplex there and it's just not the case. It has been there. Um, my understanding that there have been, through housing authority, there have been a number of tenants that live there um, over the years. This, all that we are asking to be able to do is to conform this property as to how we purchased it, to allow Mr. Johnson to continue to use it as a sixplex. We understand that there would be the permitting requirement. We also understand that, that should the board here approve this, we would also then have to get the conditional use permit or apply for that. And actually it was applied for and then it was brought to our attention that we needed to have these variances because the conditional use permit couldn't be considered when we had zoning violations. So what we're asking for today is for the planning, the Board of Zoning Appeals to allow the variance due to the unique nature of this property, the unique way in which these apartments in the basement are set up, the clientele that Mr. Johnson has that he rents to, that they don't have vehicles. He has not rented to individuals that have vehicles that also reside in the basement apartments. And to continue to allow him to have this as a sixplex once we go through the remaining process should the variances be granted. That's all I have in case there's any questions. Okay, any questions for the owner's representative? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So the property at 737, 739, when was that purchased by Mr. Johnson? It was purchased November 6th, 1989. The board would like, I have copies of the closing statement to so show. that was purchased four years before this property? Well, it was March of 92 for this property and it was November of 89 for 737, 739. Okay, so he purchased that property. That property has the same issue in the basement where it's got four apartments that we're looking at in 741 and 743? My understanding is that there's permit issues with that, yes. Okay, so he did that, those four apartments in that basement no, is what so we're looking at. No, he purchased the property with those four in there. I have a copy of the closing statement from 1989 where it references the rents that were allocated okay. at date of closing showing 737A, 737B, 739A, and 739B. So he purchased that with two basement apartments. Okay. From someone different than the Wessels. It was a Miss Fair, Doris Fair is who he purchased that from. Okay. So purchased from somebody else, already had apartments in, saying the same thing happened at 741, 743, part of the uniqueness, or when we get into the parking, part of it, what we're talking about is that the per people that he's currently renting to do not have cars, do not have a parking issue. That doesn't mean that if he sells the property, it doesn't become an issue in the future. That, that could potentially Which be is an issue. Which part of the reason why the zoning request for the city is, is if you have an apartment that you have to have so many parking spaces within that, because you can't always control who's going to be rented to. You have a current owner now, but if it go, be, is sold to somebody else, then they may not do the exact same thing. So regardless of what it is, I mean, the reason for the parking is because you can't control who owns it or who it's going to be rented to. Fair enough. Okay. And that brings in the justification with the utility meters as well. The next owner of the property may not include that as part of the rents and they would each need their own meter on it. Right, no, I agree. And I think that the meters could be put onto that, but our position is with regard to the statement, Mr. Johnson should have known that there were six there because there should have been six meters, not if it's all being paid as part of rent, so. I just want to clarify that the, that is usually the point at which staff becomes aware of the desire to add additional dwelling units is that we are contacted to provide addresses and inspect meters for those units because Westar will not put 
six meters at this address unless the city says it has six approved addresses and all city staff is saying is there are not six addresses at this location and there are not four addresses at the other location and there is a reason for that. Any other questions? For the representative or for staff? No? Okay. I, have I do have a question for okay. the staff. The current R3 zone property, does it conform with all of the zoning regulations for R3? I am not positive that that is the case, but most of these um, buildings were uh, developed prior to 1977 and what the Planning Commission did in 1977 when it um, remapped the city is it looked at what the existing use was on the property and if the existing use on the property was a duplex, then it was R2 and if the existing use was multifamily, they made it R3 and so they didn't they tried as much as possible not to create non-conforming uses and so I believe that the R3 is there because that apartment was there prior to 1977 and this Planning Commission didn't want to make it non non-conforming okay any other questions yeah same thing so if you shrink that photo up a little bit to the north of there, there's the same type of situation where we've got an R3. So is that the same thing? That's an apartment complex that's sitting there that was already pre-existing? Right. Our, our records indicate that from that building south, all the buildings built along the east side of South 2nd Street are duplexes. And that, that's why it's zoned R2, because if you go to the original permits, the permits were issued for duplexes. And so that's... For for us, um, addressing is is very important because addresses are assigned at at the building permit stage, and so that's that's how a property gets a, an apartment complex gets addresses for all its units by that's done through the building permit process. I have one other question. So, if Evergy has to contact the city in order to be able to install additional meters. That would determine that there's a process of communication. What is the process of communication between the city and the, the county appraiser for tax purposes as far as how many units are in the building? Uh, there is, I don't, I don't know what they base that on. If they base it on information that's provided to them by owners, the county appraiser does do field surveys they very rarely go inside properties they're usually doing drive-by I I would have no no idea how the county appraiser would know that this property or that property had this many units if the city didn't know because they usually rely on this city for to provide them with those records thank you like every copy of every building permit we issue goes to the county appraiser's office so that they can keep their records current. Yeah. I let Mr. Reed sit down because he was standing, but any further questions for either the owner's representative or staff? Do you okay. have anything to add, Sean, as it relates to the compliance agreement or the rationale for that? Sean Pilcher, building official. Um, uh, the compliance agreement, uh, I don't know if you guys have went through your packet and read this thing, but uh, it was uh, um, entered into on May 30, 2019, was amended on July 12, 2019, in order to uh, give an extension to July 31st, 2019, to give the uh, get, give the extension, give him time to get, get the app proper applications made. Um, the um, if the if you look at the agreement, um, it talks about how um, if the if the zone is to remain R two, the property owner has sixty days to uh, to uh, get rid of the uh, apartments down in the basement. 
and if uh, of course if it if it does if it gets if you guys get grant the um, variances then um, there's there's other items that still need to be addressed in the violation notice that's also attached in your um, thing that there there is smoke detectors which which uh, which you mentioned already but there's also numerous other items including foundation repairs and things like that um, so there's a but but right now and since the since the date and probably maybe even a little bit before uh, this was uh, entered into the apartments are vacant um, and uh, the uh, also the the units uh, back 737 to 739 um, have been converted back to a duplex uh, back in 2017. Um, so those those are no, aren't fourplex in the basement anymore. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have one on a uh, procedural note, mostly because there's three variances here. Yeah. And uh, if we approve all three, then of course it allows him to do it. If we disapprove one of those three, then it prohibits him from doing it. Yeah, I mean, in, in, I guess, theoretically, you could feel comfortable approving two of three or one of three, but yeah. the, the, the point being, from our perspective, that to be able to, for us to issue building permits to create four units in the basement, all three of those variances would have to be granted to allow us to to issue permits to to have the four units in the basement. Okay, and based on that, I just wanted to note that we could approve these one at a time, but just as Dean's explained, it all three have to be approved if you want it to happen, or one can be disapproved to stop the whole thing. So just so from a procedural perspective, we can see how we so how we need to just do this. As an example, from the building permit and our discretion that we have, if you were to approve the lot size and lot width variances, but not the parking variances. I don't have the authority to issue a permit with only the two spaces. I do have the authority to issue a permit if you grant a variance for parking. Yeah. Okay, so uh, having said that, we can make a motion to approve each of them individually or one motion to approve all three, but we'd, uh, we're open to uh, hear motions that we could discuss further from the board members. We're open for a motion at this point? Yes, we are. Then I would make a motion to deny application V20-1 on all three accounts. I second that. Okay, second it. All those, or any discussion? Before we call for a vote? No discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. That completed, Dean, any additional work? Um, that completes your public hearing items for this afternoon. We don't have any administrative items for you. We were gonna share with you um, just some information the City Commission has taken on our various board and commission meetings. As of June 5th, our city boards can now meet live and in person and not, not with the phone call-in technology. And so uh, the other thing that was done, just so you're aware of, of staffing and staffing limitations, um, almost all city departments are on different forms of work share and reduced hour staffing. And that applies to billing services, planning, and we have some employees on furlough. So because of that, we went to the city commission and they have adjusted the meeting schedules of our various boards and commissions. So our planning division, we support the work of four different boards plus the city commission. So basically all of our boards are only meeting once a month. And so the only board whose schedule didn't change was yours because you only meet once a month anyway. But the planning commission, has two meetings a month, they're meeting once a month. The design review board is meeting once a month. They normally meet twice. So just so you're aware, the other thing is that the uh, city offices are closed on Friday. 
and we have had it's somewhat confusing because the county is open on Friday but the city is closed on Friday so if you're coming down here to conduct business or to talk to somebody you're going to find doors locked and lights off so we just want you to be aware of that okay. and at this time um, we don't presently have anything uh, filed for July um, we have had um, record numbers of swimming pool permits that we've issued everyone in Salina seemingly is wanting to put a pool in their backyard this summer and um, but we have not that's not resulted in any variance cases and just um, some of the we've had some accessibility and communication uh, challenges so there are people out there that I've had discussions with about submitting variance applications but we just don't have anything in yet but we will either send you a cancellation notice for your July meeting or we'll let you know that we're going to meet but um, your meeting schedule is unchanged for the rest of the year it'll still be the third Thursday of each month and we'll either inform you of the meeting uh, or a cancellation okay anyone else have anything for the good of the committee no well, I'd like to thank you Mr. Reed for coming your uh, input was very uh, informative and I'll call to adjourn the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals meeting for June <laughs>